And uh, as soon as COVID hit, it, I knew exactly what was happening with the very first thing it said, Hubei province, there's a new virus, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was totally predictable. But now the question was, what is the adaptation? Uh, what has the microbiome produced here? And interestingly, this coronavirus has a new RNA strand, at least that's what we think so far. There's a lot of you know, uh, intense work that needs to be done over the next year or two to really you know, detail out this RNA strand within this new, this, this new variant of the coronavirus. Um, but what it's starting to look like is we have gotten an adaptation from an extreme stress state of the microbiome of Central Asia um, out of the toxicity of our farming industry and agricultural systems there that is now allowing a resilience to occur. And I'm very excited to be putting into play some large you know, clinical trial dollars from an impact investment fund called the Pandemic Fund, working with, with this group out of New York to channel this money towards clinical trials to show that this viral update has actually been beneficial to mankind. Remember that more than you know, 60% of the people that were exposed to this virus never had any symptoms, meaning we took this virus in, we integrated into our genetic you know, experience and in, into, in some cases, into the genetic matrix itself. And then in some cases, we had mild symptoms. And so you know, probably in the 80 to 90% range of people exposed either had no symptoms or very mild symptoms with this genetic update. Then a very, very small section becomes critically ill and even a smaller section of them die. So we're at a mortality, maybe around 0.1, 0.3%. So we're at a pretty bad flu season kind of level of mortality here. This may be you know, one of the, the top 10 you know, most deadly kind of flu season type respiratory viruses that we've seen in the last decade. But it's certainly nothing you know, like catastrophically above anything we've ever seen. It's, it's very much in line with what influenza is capable of doing from a mortality standpoint. So why is it killing anybody? If this is a, just a genetic update, why is anybody dying from this virus? And it turns out that uh, this, the answers are right in Hubei province again. And so if you look at Hubei as a unique toxic stew, not only do you have the highest glyphosate and Roundup levels in the world being sprayed into their soils, highest antibiotic usage in the pork industry in the world, you couple that now with the air pollution of Beijing. Beijing, just north of Hubei, gets pressed down by, by the uh, northern hemisphere uh, air pocket coming down from the Arctic pushes that air pollution down into Hubei. It turns out that a huge uh, critical part of the toxicity of air pollution is something called PM 2.5. And this is particulate matter, 2.5 microns in size or smaller, that is suspended in a cubic meter of air. So PM 2.5 per cubic meter is a measurement of, of air pollution toxicity. And it's science studies have proven in the last decades that PM 2.5 binds the influenza virus and binds the coronavirus so that it will clump. So now instead of an evenly distributed genetic update, you get an abnormal clumping of too much genetic information in a very small particle. And then you have a delivery system. So it turns out that the coronavirus, like every other intelligent virus system out there, not only did the organism, remember humans, produced every single virus that ever infected another human being was made by a human being. And so we produced the virus and we produced it with an intelligent uh, direction. So in the case of coronavirus, we cover that viral envelope with a receptor for the ACE2 receptors in the lung of, of mammals. It also goes on to bind the ACE2 receptor in vascular systems and beyond, smooth muscle, et cetera. And so we have a delivery system now of uh, that's going to bind to the lung material of somebody that not only has an abnormal clump of too much genetic information, it's also carrying air pollution with it, which happens to have a component of cyanide. Cyanide is now being pulled into the bloodstream by an intelligent viral packet as a Trojan horse delivering a toxin that causes hypoxia. If you look up the textbook of cyanide poisoning, it's called histotoxic hypoxia. The presentation of these patients in poisoned by cyanide are identical to the ways in which people died from COVID-19. COVID-19 never caused hypoxic injury in a human being. It has to be combined with other toxicities to achieve this. And it has to be in a physiology that was predisposed to this injury. And, and so we see the comorbidities of cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, so heart disease and stroke, chronic kidney disease and diabetes is these three major risk factors for, for having complications from COVID. Well, why is that? Why is the kidney and the heart and the, and the, the, the liver of the diabetic predisposing to a respiratory virus? And it turns out that we have to put those three categories of patients on the exact same two drugs, which is an ACE inhibitor and a statin drug. 
And those two drugs upregulate the ACE2 receptor in our lungs. And so we pharmaceuticalize the world to absorb a virus at a higher concentration than it ever should have been absorbed. And it's meanwhile binding pollution with cyanide on it to cause a histotoxic hypoxia. And we get uh, an hypoxic injury to the whole organism. An incredible study was published in JAMA looking at 5,700 patients admitted to New York hospitals. And it turns out the average temperature of those patients was normal, 37 degrees. The average white blood cell count, low normal at six. With the amount of lymphocytes or left shift that we would typically see with infection, normal. So no signs of infection, no fever, no white blood cell change, everything else. They presented instead with hypoxia and early liver injury from that hypoxic injury. And then three to four days later, they will accumulate fluid in their lungs and die subsequently of pneumonia and interestingly, blood clots within the tiny vessels called disseminated intravascular coagulation. So DIC or coagulation in the blood vessels is the downstream effect of cyanide poisoning and, and the hypoxic event. And so we are watching literally thousands of patients dying, not from a virus, but from the combination of glyphosate forcing a stress signal from a virome that then delivers air pollution to the bloodstream of humanity. And if you look at Northern Italy, it is the highest concentration of PM 2.5 and cyanide in the entire European uh, uh, body. And then you look at New York City and Louisiana and uh, the four corners of Colorado, pockets in Idaho, pockets up around Seattle. These are all areas where we have the convergence of high agricultural environments, high energy and transportation uh, uh, combinations to create high PM 2.5, high cyanide levels, binding to a naturally occurring virus that meant no harm, was there to give us an, a, an adaptive phase, but through the toxicity of our own lifestyles, we created a toxic stew that would kill ourselves. We are literally killing ourselves and blaming it on a virus, and it's tragic for the mistakes that we're going to make at the, at the policy level. We're going to spend $500 billion over the next 6 to 12 months trying to invent vaccines to protect us from a virus that never meant no harm to us, Whereas we could have spent that $500 billion revolutionizing the food system such that we would never spray glyphosate again, and we could have solved the whole problem in one year, and we won't because we have vilified the virome.